this time on Only in America. The pastor who says God believes in borders. God is not necessarily an open borders guy, as a lot of people would think that he is. And the Bible says God has ordained government to protect its citizens. Ice gets colder towards the undocumented, which means problems for the Idaho dairy industry. The bottom line is that diversity, especially in this fairly rural part of Idaho, has been overwhelmingly positive for communities. A strong economy has been built on diversity. And guess who's coming to dinner in Boise? Overcoming the fear when a new family moves in next door. I would say the greatest Thanksgiving I've ever had. Just an incredible experience in talking to them and hearing the stories. The saddest thing about that was, they had been in the country for four and a half years, and that was the first time they had been in an American home. From the National Immigration Forum, I'm Ali Nirani. Welcome to Only in America. When Fox and Friends is making your point, the world is sideways. Last week, they covered a letter sent by the Evangelical Immigration Table to members of Congress. The letter called for a bipartisan solution to the battle over the DREAM Act. It was signed by nearly 3,500 local pastors and church leaders. Fox host Ainsley Earhart interviewed Robert Jeffress, the senior pastor of First Baptist Dallas and a Fox News contributor. While Christian compassion is one consideration, it's not the only consideration in the immigration problem. I mean, the Bible also says that God's the one who established nations and its borders. God is not necessarily an open borders guy, as a lot of people would think that he is. And the Bible says God has ordained government to protect its citizens. So if we're talking about a civil solution to immigration, yes, we need to talk about compassion, but we need to balance that with government real responsibility to protect its citizens. Isn't that what they're saying? They're saying valuing and protecting immigrants while also protecting national security. They are, but I think they tend to uh, lean on the side of compassion and don't balance it like it should. And I think these leaders are sincere, but they're sincerely confused about the difference between the church and government. Earhart closed the interview, capturing the tension of the issue and the essence of the letter when she said, the Bible does tell us to honor our authorities and follow the rule of law, but it tells us to be compassionate. I don't know, I think we can chalk this up as a win. Meanwhile, the DC debate is a bit chaotic these days. Republicans are upset the president got ahead of them, meaning the conservative base will pressure conservative lawmakers to reassert their authority by proposing increasingly harsh enforcement measures. Now, if conservative media and districts are ceded to the opposition, legislation will just move to the extreme right, making it harder for Democrats to stay on board. Now, it's important to understand the need for a balanced DREAM Act that does include certain enforcement measures. These should include infrastructure improvements to border ports of entry and clearing the sight lines along the Rio Grande River. Smart, effective, efficient border security measures endorsed by law enforcement, business, and the community alike. Interior enforcement measures, or elements of the, the RAISE Act, lower security, and undermine American workers, tipping what will be a precarious compromise. Support for the National Immigration Forum comes from the Walmart Foundation, so retail sector employees can receive contextualized English language training through our project, Skills and Opportunity for the New American Workforce. And from the Carnegie Corporation of New York, established in 1911 by Andrew Carnegie to promote the advancement and diffusion of knowledge and understanding. The Trump administration's enthusiastic encouragement for ICE immigration and customs enforcement, to arrest more undocumented immigrants has led to tension and fear across the nation, especially in the Magic Valley of Idaho, where mostly Hispanic workers are, in the words of one well-respected reporter, the backbone of a surging dairy industry. Since news spread in July that ICE is offering to pay $1.3 million a year to rent jail beds from county commissioners in Jerome County in southern Idaho, many of these Hispanic workers have started thinking about uprooting their families and leaving town. But there are plenty of people in high places who want them to stay. 
I spoke with Priscilla Salant, who until recently directed the McClure Center for Public Policy Research at the University of Idaho. She told me a labor shortage is the biggest challenge facing the state's dairy owners. So Priscilla and I are sitting in downtown Boise at the Dawson Taylor Coffee Roasters, uh, hence the background noise of espresso machines and whatnot. So Priscilla, first of all, describe to me your sense of how the state of Idaho has changed um, as a result of, of immigration. All of our research points to a very positive um, impact of immigration on Idaho. We experienced probably the largest surge of immigration in the 90s, some in the 2000s. It slowed dramatically, but the positive economic benefits that began in the 90s and in the 2000s persist today with a very diversified economy, especially in South Central Idaho, where many, many of our immigrants have moved. So let's take you in a step back here. How did you get to Idaho? My husband and I chose Idaho as a place to live based on our ability to get jobs. We lived in Moscow in the northern part of the state, so there are economic opportunities here in, in Idaho, and we also moved for quality of life. We lived in a small community that was the perfect place to raise children. As you were kind of setting up roots in, in Idaho, was there a moment in, as you're raising the, your family and moving through your career where you realized that the state was changing and you realized in a way that um, almost illustrated, it illustrated the data that was so much more, so much more personal than the data that you studied? I lived in um, northern Idaho, which is a largely non-Hispanic population for over 20 years. And then in 2009, I moved down to the southern part of the state, particular to the Treasure Valley, which is southwest Idaho, and I realized that the state of southern Idaho is, is much, much different than northern Idaho, and the demographic and economic changes in the south really are tied in some ways to immigration, but it is an increasingly diverse population in southern Idaho that is almost invisible to the people in the northern part of the state. So it was that actually travel broadens people's horizons and in my case I just had to move from the northern part of the state to the southern part to realize that Idaho is undergoing a huge transformation. How was the economy different between, say, northern Idaho and southern, where you moved in southern Idaho, and what was the role of the immigrant population in, those, in, the, in the southern part of the state? The north has historically been very natural resource dependent, in particular dependent on mining and forestry. And while those industries don't employ very many people anymore, there's still a real culture around resource dependence and new industry is largely it's a lot of it is service based so service and natural resources in the northern part of the state the southern part of the state of course is much more urban there's 40 percent of the state's population lives in the Boise Ada County metropolitan area this is where our urban area is then moving east across southern Idaho, you see a really amazingly diverse agricultural economy with both production of raw products and processing. So the economies of north and south look a lot different and you feel a sense of economic vibrancy in the south that you don't really feel up north. So over the next couple of days, I'm going to be spending some time with the, the milk processing community, dairy owners, uh, processors, cheese, cheese producers, etc. So give me a sense of kind of how the dairy industry has changed in the state and, and what's the crucial role that the migrant population has played in the dairy industry specifically. Idaho's dairy industry has very closely tracked the national trends of fewer farms producing much larger quantities. So you, you really have an industrial scale dairy sector that has grown right alongside of milk processing. Dairy production is very labor intensive and as dairies expanded in the 1990s and in the early part of the 2000s, they had huge demand for labor. That industry would never have grown the way it has without the immigrant labor coming in. But that wasn't the end of the story. The processing grew, the milk processing grew, also high demand for labor, but less likely to be undocumented. And then from the dairy processing, 
came an even more diverse food processing industry. So you have Cliff Bar and Annie's Pasta and all kinds of food processing that wasn't here before. You could really see the economic diversification occurring really on the shoulders of the immigrant labor that originally moved here for dairies. And this is in the context of an overall very tight labor market in the state. So, you know, looking forward, what do you see in terms of a worker shortage or, you know, frankly, all of these companies that have moved to the state uh, because of, of availability of labor? And what's the, what are the challenges that, that lie ahead for them? It, especially in South Central Idaho with the dairy industry, a person gets a clear sense that something has to give in the labor market. Either wages have to go up, benefits have to go up, the supply of labor coming into the state has to go up or there has to be automation because where they are now is simply not sustainable. They can't get the labor that they need. And you see that not only in dairy but in other parts of the economy as well. Some people will say that supply and demand will start balancing out. More people will move here because um, there are jobs here. But we haven't seen very much upward pressure on wages. That it probably has to do with the global nature of our agriculturally dependent economy. So if the employers can't afford to pay more, it's really not clear to me what's going to happen. Without paying more or without an increased supply of labor, this shortage, this real bottleneck, labor bottleneck will continue. So what do you think the story is of the Magic Valley that needs to or should be told to the rest of the country? The bottom line is that diversity, especially in this fairly rural part of Idaho, has been overwhelmingly positive for communities. That a strong economy has been built on diversity. That's what I would like Idahoans and the rest of the country to know, is that diversity has been such a positive influence on our state. And part of that diversity is also the the influx of refugees to the state. Um, I don't think many people across the country realize that uh, the state has been bringing in roughly a thousand refugees per year. What has been the impact on the southern part of the state and what do you think, what are the tensions that come with that as well? Certainly in the last year and a half or so we have seen tensions around the refugee issue but it turns out now in retrospect that the tensions were really fueled by the alt-right news media that really our communities have been adjusting well, have have been welcoming to refugees historically and continuing into the last several years, but we've really seen the negative impact of people from outside the state wanting to use us as a kind of case in point to say there are problems here. But the story is that the alt-right news had to retract their so-called news reports that they made that in fact things actually are going well in the part of the state where the refugees are resettled. Patricia Salant is the recently retired director of the McClure Center for Public Policy Research at the University of Idaho. You can read more about her work at immigrationforum.org. After the break, more from Idaho on the new opportunities for partnership with the immigrant population. Yeah, I really believe that police chiefs, and sheriffs, and law enforcement, they've got an opportunity. And don't have to know anything, we don't have to be special people but there's an opportunity to invite people to a table and because you're in that position in your community, they'll come to the table. Support for the National Immigration Forum comes from the Walmart Foundation, so retail sector employees can receive contextualized English language training through our project, skills and opportunity for the new American workforce and from the Carnegie Corporation of New York, established in 1911 by Andrew Carnegie to promote the advancement and diffusion of knowledge and understanding. I'm Aline Nirani with Only in America. Back to Idaho and the state capital, Boise, where I met Police Chief Bill Bones. He told me of the strides the police have made in integrating immigrant workers into the community over more than two decades. And he told me how a trip to Walmart can be some people's highlight of the week. It's strange. So you've got this, uh, in Boise, you've got this increasing diversity of culture 
and the richness of ideas. And so it's great to be able to go out to new restaurants and you see new tech companies coming that people came from out of the country and have created. Um, but then you see this fear. So people are afraid of something different and uh, the change. And that was kind of an underlying issue for us for quite a while. But as the national debate has heated up in these past couple of years, it's really become an issue for us on the local front of creating some of that separation within the community between ideological groups and that fear that's been created among a much of our refugee population or our immigrant population. And trying to get people to the table, what we found obviously is what everybody finds is if you can get people face-to-face -face conversation, it takes that fear away. There's this picture that's painted when you look at a national media of who is living next door to you if they're a refugee or an immigrant, and it's usually very different than who the actual person is. I really believe that police chiefs and sheriffs and law enforcement, they've got an opportunity and don't have to know anything. We don't have to be special people, but there's an opportunity to invite people to a table. And because you're in that position in your community, they'll come to the table. And when you get the people in the room, if you facilitate the conversations, then the solutions will create themselves and you start to break down those barriers. And I don't think that's just with refugee or immigration. That's with any social issue. As the social safety nets from the federal level have continued to get cut back and now at the state level because of funding um, or political realities, then those problems tend to fall to law enforcement. So if you don't step up and create a unified approach, a partnership approach with your community to try to solve those issues, we're going to fail. We can't do it by ourselves. And that ability to bring people and open up the discussion, I found once you, once you open the doors, mm -hmm. it's uh, self-sustaining. So as I've been you know, traveling the country, people often ask me, okay, well, what can I do? And I find myself talking more and more about institutions and the importance of organizations. Um, so as you're pulling together these conversations, are you working through institutions within the community or really kind of reaching out to people as individuals? I think you've got to decide where you're comfortable at, mm -hmm. right? So if you're involved in your faith organization, Almost every faith organization or some affiliate of that faith organization is doing some type of outreach on this issue. Um, there's numerous businesses, the school systems, if you know what I mean, maybe where, you're, where your kids are at, because obviously their friends are in the schools. But it can also be at a very personal level. So I'm obviously most of the stuff I'm involved in is out in groups and in the public. But two years ago, Thanksgiving, we had our, our family wasn't going to be there. So it was just going to be um, just my daughter, wife, and some friends and took the opportunity to invite a refugee family to come and have Thanksgiving dinner with us. I would say the greatest Thanksgiving I've ever had. Just an incredible experience in talking to them and hearing the stories. But the saddest thing about that was they had been in the country for four and a half years and that was the first time they had been in an American home. And that's a failure, that's our neighbors. This, this is people that are here completely legally. They, they went through unbelievable trauma before getting to the US. They've got a great story, um, cutest kids in the world, and they had never been in an American home. You know, he's working two jobs. They're, they're telling me literally going to Chuck E. Cheese's once a week is their big highlight and going to Walmart once a week. That, that I mean, they're so buried in trying to be successful and the kids are doing great in school, and you're like, wow, look where they're coming and, and look the lessons I can learn from them. It's a story that I've, I've heard so many times where the refugee family is incredibly grateful, say, to a Baptist church in South Carolina for helping them resettle. But then their one question is, but why didn't anybody invite us over for, for a meal? Uh, it's so simple, but uh, it takes a big step. And it's uh, something that you will gain far more from than the refugee family or the immigrant family, which you're helping out. I'm going to tell you, the richness of that experience is something that you couldn't buy, um, that we would travel, right, internationally. We'd spend thousands of dollars to go to have this, this home visit meal, right? I mean, that's, there's a whole thing around tourism that's, that's that right now, the homestay or home visit. You've got people in almost every neighborhood in America that you could invite. And you, like in Boise, you know, you drive down, you're seeing people, whether it's from... Africa or Asia or the Middle East and just reach out your hand and you'd be surprised at the response you're going to get. So tell me a little bit about what you're doing here at the department in terms of uh, working with the refugee community because I remember the conversation when earlier uh, one of your staffers who, who led that, that work. Right so we had an officer a neighborhood contact officer working in the community and she realized about 10 years ago you know look I've got these different refugee populations coming in and it was somebody that, that didn't have a trust for law enforcement. 
obviously most of our refugee population, they're coming from countries where the police are the bad guys. That's just the reality of the world mm -hmm. that um, they've lived in. And to try to build those relationships and that trust, um, we created the Refugee Liaison Program. So now we have a full-time officer that their entire job is focused around reaching out to our refugee population. So from the time they get here to the United States, educating them on United States laws, creating the, the trust between police, knowing that we're a resource, not the, uh, not the bad guy in the room, that we're somebody that they can reach out to for help. And it's got to be an education on the difference in laws. So, right, I mean, whether it's driving or whether it's how you treat your spouse or your children, those can be very different and there can be hard cultural changes to make, but that has evolved into strong ties between us and the refugee groups, which we have here, obviously working with the leadership, and that uh, has really spun to provide us some, some just strong depth of relationship and it's headed off massive problems. It's reduced the calls for service, the times that officers have to go to um, a certain location and their chances at success. Mm -hmm. And then the second thing that we've done, we've got a mentorship relationship program right now where officers pair up with a refugee from the community. Mm -hmm. And when we open that up, you know, you're a little timid. Is anybody gonna sign up for this? I've got 25-year officers, you know, that you might think we're kind of the salty old guy. No, they're like the most excited people in the world to do that. And you see their faces just lighting up in this instant connection. And when we did it, it was supposed to be a temporary program. They wouldn't let it go. Language helplines. Uh, most agencies, well, every agency across the U.S. emergency services, they use language lines. So when you've got somebody that doesn't speak a, a language, you don't have somebody that can interpret, you call. It's very expensive, very lucrative for whoever's running it, and we've got to have it, so I'm thankful that they do it, but it's very expensive and it's impersonal. But what we did was we created our own program here within the department where we take our refugee population, people that speak the languages, we get them through the background process so that they can come out and be on-site interpreters for them. Mm -hmm. So we've got phone calls, multiple people on call, they're out there. They're familiar with the culture. Mm -hmm. They're not part of that direct family, so you don't have to worry about something getting you know, put out in the wrong way to the officer. And that, in turn, creates those, those relationships. Uh, we created a paid liaison program. So we've got a liaison position that we create, that we choose somebody from the refugee community. They come in and work in an intern position for the police department, or we'll rotate that around. Maybe next time we'll put them down and we'll create that at the library or the parks, because yeah. there are different organizations within the city that are providing those services. Yeah. And then hopefully, um, we get those people in full-time employment transition to the city and build those additional ties. As you see the city changing demographically, whether it's immigration or refugee resettlement, what do you think that means for your workforce and your department moving forward? Well, A, we have to understand the cultural differences. Mm -hmm. B, we've got to grow with our diversity within the police department as the city grows. And we're a little ahead of that now. Um, we run usually 5 or 6% ahead. But if you're not putting effort into being on the front end of that, you'll end up behind. Many of our lessons were learned from mistakes, right, as we all do. When I started as a police officer, we had a large Laotian immigrant mm -hmm. um, population refugee, and we did zero outreach. And that quickly developed into um, a group of especially young kids that felt alienated, from the community, people that didn't know that the police were somebody they could go to as a resource. And so we ended up with organized crime, preying on, on the adults, and we ended up with youth forming into gangs. And that ended up into massive issues for us to deal with from a, a safety and, and criminal activity, right? We see the exact opposite when we do the reach out on the, on the front end. And we're able to prevent that and get people involved in the community. And then if you are, to have that ultra-rare experience where you've got somebody that might get involved in serious criminal or domestic terrorism, then you've got the, a community that's, that sees the police as an ally, and they're going to come to you about that person. And we all know the way that terrorism is going to occur is that somebody feels alienated, disconnected from the community that they're part of. That doesn't mean you're from another country. It happens even more often in the U.S. with somebody that's born and raised here, multi-generational. But building ties to people that are involved with those people that will come forward to the police, that community partnership, that trust, that's essential to what we do in policing. That's the only way we can be effective is if we got the trust of every group we serve. And we've got to be most aware of the communities that are most vulnerable to be preyed upon by others. So then kind of asking the question from a, a national perspective and kind of 
putting you in my shoes, where you know, what do you think the story is that the rest of the country sees about Idaho, and what's the story that you would like to tell the rest of the country about Idaho? I always struggle when they they see Idaho. We unfortunately go back to some years and years ago, you know, with some national stories on white supremacists, mm-hmm. or we're the potato state, <laughs> and I would invite everybody. And we, this is how we get our, our most of our business and recruits. They fly into Boise for whatever reason. And they go downtown and they're like, what? This is like nice. There's no litter on the streets and people are smiling and friendly and it's beautiful and it's the climate's great and business is hopping and it's, it's got this hip feel and it's like this shock. And I, I, want to, I want to say this is an example of, and I want to keep it this way, of what a city and state can be as they grow into the, the larger populations and still have that small town feel. And I'm really worried as a police chief, obviously, of keeping the safety and security of the community as we get bigger and bigger. But diversity for us has been an incredible building block. And it's just that multiplier that we see in the way people think and look. And if you look at downtown, it is booming. And new businesses, new ideas. And we've got people moving here from across the country because they can have that both great people and a great, great environment to to be a part of. Chief Bones, thank you very much for the time. I appreciate it. You can find out more about Chief Bones at our website, immigrationforum.org. And while you're there, don't forget to subscribe to our weekly newsletter. That's all for this edition. Our podcast is produced by the staff of the National Immigration Forum. I'm Ali Narani. Join us again next week for Only in America.